Hey guys, this is part three of my ranking of all of the historical fiction and fantasy TV series that I watched in 2021. So you guys, if you've made it through all three parts, thank you very much. I appreciate it because I know these videos are very, very lengthy. So I do greatly appreciate it if you did take the time to watch these very long videos because I know you have better things to do in your day. Um, so yeah, this is the final part. This is going to be the top 10, and yeah, uh, just to put up the guidelines of this video really quickly, here are the guidelines. First up, this is all going to be historical fiction and fantasy TV series only. Um, I was originally going to do historical fiction only, but then I was like, you know, I'm going to go ahead and add fantasy in there because a lot of times fantasy tends to have uh, kind of like a historical fiction aesthetic anyway. So that's why I decided to go ahead and include fantasy on this list as well. Second, anything set before the 2000s is included in this list. Um, as you watch all three of these videos, uh, there's going to be several TV series included on this list that are set in, in the 1990s. So yeah, as long as uh, any show is set before the 2000s, it was up for game for this list. Third, these rankings are based on my personal enjoyment and the entertainment that I got from each specific show. So yeah, it is. It's, it is all very personal to me, the, the entertainment I got out of it, the emotional level of, uh, that I got out of it. Um, and, and yeah, in a way, the ranking almost doesn't matter to some degree. In, in a way, the ranking is just really for me to keep things organized and in terms of how I want to talk about things. But yeah, as far as the rankings go, you're either going to agree or disagree. It's called opinions, obviously. Uh, and yeah, some of these shows, I mean, depending on my mood, some of them can flip up and down throughout the ranking. Who knows? But yeah, this is just the ranking as I saw fit for me personally. Fourth, all of the series included on this list were all shows that I did watch in 2021, um, and that includes shows that not only were released in 2021, but if I happened to watch something for the very first time in 2020, 2021, even if it was released years ago. So everything is up for grabs in this video. At number 10, Shadow and Bone. Season 1 follows a young woman who has an extraordinary power that may help save her war-torn land, starring Jesse May Lee, Archie Renault, and Ben Barnes. Okay, I know that Shadow and Bone is a huge popular book series within the young adult community, and unfortunately I haven't read those books, but I knew they were popular. So when I started hearing about the show and I saw the trailers, I was like, okay, I'm going to give this show a shot, see if I like it since it's very popular, and I'm so glad I watched the show. I freaking loved this first season, you guys, and as soon as the season was over, I went out and bought every single damn book. <laughs> Um, so I'm very excited to read the books at some point and dig further into this world. But yeah, season one, wow, I was pretty thoroughly impressed with this first season uh, because, because I knew it was a young adult series. And I think I was kind of expecting it to be a certain way. And it just really exceeded my expectations and just really impressed me. Um, just the, the, the mature nature of the show I think that there's a lot more to it and it's it's actually pretty dark and deep and whatnot so I really appreciated uh, this show you know outside of it being a, a young adult show and whatnot this was such a gorgeous show as well it looked beautiful I loved the influences of Russian culture in there it definitely had like that imperial russia look to it with the clothing and some of the styles of the buildings and whatnot um i really loved the look of the shows just so beautiful i think it was very well well written just such a very wonderful cast of characters actors and whatnot uh, ben barnes definitely steals the show i am definitely a number one uh, darkling Fan now, you guys. I'm all for the Darkling. I'm here for it. Uh, his relationship and chemistry um, with Alina and whatnot. I was like, ooh, this is too hot. <laughs> yes, he's the bad guy, but he's a sympathetic bad guy, right? <laughs> and I just really love the story of Alina as well, because she's a, a young woman 
uh, who really doesn't know anything about herself and she realizes she has these remarkable powers that, that she can uh, just wave out like huge amounts of like light and whatnot you know which is a great contrast to the darkling who really emits like darkness and evil you know um i loved her journey of trying to discover herself and find herself and really gaining confidence self-confidence and whatnot and uh learning to trust herself and her abilities and uh, i think she's going to be really fascinating to continue into the next couple seasons and whatnot so yeah give me the next seasons yeah guys at number nine season two of the witcher season two picks up following Geralt and Ciri as they search for the origins of Ciri's powers and how she can control them while in the meantime Yennefer deals with the ramifications of the battle of Sodden Hill where she now has lost her magical powers starring Henry Cavill, Anya Shalatra, Freya Allen, and Joey Beatty Season 2 was a wild improvement to Season 1, you guys. Uh, I did a full review for Season 2, if you are interested in more of my thoughts. But yeah, a big thing about Season 2, I wasn't confused. <laughs> I love the fact that Season 2 was a lot more linear. It made a lot more sense. I was able to get into it better. I was able to understand the world building better. And more than anything, I actually cared and loved these characters, which I can't say the same about season one. Um, so season two was definitely a vast improvement. Um, I really found myself being like, okay, I want to binge one more episode, you know? Uh, but I had to stop at some point, you know? I couldn't sit and binge all eight episodes in one go. Season two definitely gets a lot more into the politics of this world, all of the various different alliances going on, all of the power struggles, all of the women in this world um, really having to face issues and trying to discover themselves and their own place in the world. And I did. I loved uh, Yennefer, or, or yeah, I loved Yennefer this season. Um, the fact that she has lost her magical powers, she has to get creative and clever. She has to think outside of the box. She has to to really rely on her own self to get herself out of a sticky situation and whatnot. Uh, learn that her powers do not define her. And then I love the father-daughter father -daughter dynamic between Ciri and Geralt this season as well. Um, Geralt who, I, you know, when he first found out that, you know, Ciri's, Ciri kind of being, uh, kind of, you know, him getting her through law of, law of surprise and whatnot. And, him almost seeing her as a nuisance and like I, I don't want this I don't need it but he kind of realizing okay I need to take care of this young woman I can train her I can help her grow and develop and yes Siri really growing and developing and uh, I found her just so interesting this season and her learning about her origins learning about her powers so yeah everything about this season everything from the special effects the costuming the writing the characters just everything about this whole season up a notch completely from season one and I loved it and it, it made me excited for season three. At number eight, Detective Anna. This 56 episode first season is set in a small Russian town in 1888 and follows a young woman named Anya who can speak to the dead and works with the local detective to help solve crime. Starring Alexandra Nikiafirovna and Dmitri Fried. Detective Anna came out of nowhere in 2021 for me, you guys. Uh, I was just on YouTube browsing around and I, I just kind of discovered this show. Yes, on YouTube. The entirety of season one is up on free on YouTube, you guys. Um, it's on a channel called Star Media and uh, it's all Russian television shows on that channel. Um, so that's how I discovered it, just kind of browsing through YouTube, and I'm so glad I just, through happenstance, discovered this show. As I said, it is a Russian show, it's completely in Russians, um, I, I definitely watched it with subtitles. Um, this was su such a charming show, you guys. Um, I was kind of expecting it to be a little dark and dreary, because it's set in Russia in the late 1800s, and... You know, I, I think we all have this image of Russia that it's kind of dark and bleak and cold. And there's actually just so much life to this show, even though it all it's also about death, because Anya can speak to the dead and, and, and whatnot. I just really adored this show. It was fun and 
and there there was great moments of comedy contrasted with all of the the darkness in there um anna as as a detective she she's just an amateur detective she can she can speak to the dead not many people know that when she does tell people that she can speak to the dead they're not quite sure if she really can but she really can and it does it helps solve crime and i love the relationship that she forms with the local uh detective in town um the the two of them have such a a wonderful chemistry throughout all 56 episodes yes 56 episodes of one season you guys their chemistry is what you watch this show for and their journey together and the the trust respect the partnership that they that they share um and yeah will he ever discover that she truly can speak to the dead you know and really appreciate her for that um season one ends in a very very dramatic way uh i can't wait to watch season two um the channel that i do watch it on uh they haven't released season two yet with the subtitles so i have to wait for the subtitles unfortunately but i'm dying to watch season two to see where things go um i, I just really loved seeing a show like this that was it it's a russian production starring russian actors and it's just about kind of everyday russian people in some ways you know it, it was just a breath of fresh air watching this show there's just such a believability to it and a uniqueness um and i, did, I just thoroughly freaking loved this show season two of why women kill set in 1949 this 10 episode season follows a middle-aged housewife who dreams of status and glamour by joining the local garden club but a female rival and the secrets of her husband threaten her plans and she will do anything to get what she wants starring allison tolman lana Perea, and nick frost i had my concerns heading into season two of why women kill you guys because i absolutely loved season one of the show and i just wasn't sure if season two would compare because season one is its own thing its own story because the way they're kind of doing this show they're doing it like an, an anthology series and whatnot so yeah season two is it's completely own thing that doesn't relate to season one season two totally worked for me and i, I quickly fell in love with it it still retains everything that you love about season one it's still witty and charming and whimsical and rather bizarre and absurd and over the top it is still darkly comedic um uh, these characters are just so completely unbelievable the things that they're doing and saying the situations that they're getting in but you you buy into it and you just absolutely love the story that's being told um once again the show is darkly comedic and i love dark humor you guys it provides for just great bits of dialogue and just a particular type of humor you know and that's something i particularly like allison tolman delivers a really re remarkable performance um this this middle-aged housewife who who really dreams of just doing something else with her life she's she's so fed up with her status in life and she she just wants a little bit of glitz and glamour and everything and she really looks up to lana Perea's character lana Perea's character who is very she is the very definition of glitz and glamour and and whatnot within their community and ultimately what this show is about even though it's set in 1949 i think to a modern audience we can most definitely relate to it because the show is almost, in a weird sort of way, almost a commentary on our obsession with social media and our obsession with ourselves and how we look and how people perceive us and how we want to perceive ourselves to others. This show definitely plays with that um, because Alison Tolman's character, she sees herself as just so dowdy and whatnot and she wants to be gorgeous and beautiful and she really wants to pres present a false image of herself that's not really her true self at the end of the day so i i love that this show really tackles that even once again it's set in 1949 but you can see it kind of it's very modern almost uh, that these issues of self-image self-perception um how people view us uh it's something that has been going on 
for decades. You know, it's nothing new. So yeah, season two, thoroughly loved it. And I, I, I definitely hope there's a season three and I'm curious what season three will explore. At number six, World Without End. This eight-part miniseries takes place during the Hundred Year War between England and France and the outbreak of the Black Death. Starring Charlotte Riley, Tom Weston Jones, Oliver Jackson Cohen, Miranda Richardson, and Cynthia Nixon. World Without End is a fairly old show. I just got around to it, and I freaking loved it. It was so, so good. Um, it is based off of the book by Ken Follett, and it's a very gigantic book. Uh, the story is a large story. There's a lot of characters. There's a lot of just miscellaneous plot going on. But this, this, all eight episodes, sometimes it's like, okay, how are these characters, what, what, what's the point of these characters? What's the point of these stories? And by the time you get to the last couple episodes, it's like everything that you thought was kind of really miscellaneous and random, everything kind of does start to gradually float closer and close together uh, to really make an absolutely compelling, captivating story. And uh, I love that it was set kind of during this time period, set during the Hundred Year War, set during the Black Death and whatnot. Um, there's a lot of turmoil going on between France and England during this time period, and you got to throw in a plague on top of it. So. Um, I loved the story in general. Um, I really loved the the huge cast of characters, just such a remarkable cast. Um, um, uh, uh, as with Ken Follett's uh, stories and whatnot, what I kind of gather, um, he, he really appreciates stories that involve uh, corruption in some ways, greed and corruption, and kind of the everyday people who want to stand against that, and that's very much what this show is about in, in some ways, um, dealing with a very greedy, corrupt church. So I did, I, 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 at the end of the day, I really loved World Without End, um, the, where the story went, where the characters went. I can't wait to read the book adaptation, or I can't, the book rather, I can't wait to read the book uh, of this, uh, and see how similar or different it is. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've, I've an amazing good time that I had with this show. At number five, Pillars of the Earth. This eight-part miniseries centers on the construction of a cathedral in the 12th century following a large cast of characters who face green and corruption within the church and are determined to do the right thing and reveal the truth about events that are being covered up by those in power. Starring Rufus Sewell, Ian McShane, Matthew McFadden, Eddie Redmayne, and Haley Atwell. So, yeah, another Ken Follett adaptation, you guys. Uh, Pillars of the Earth is actually... Uh, first, and then it's a world without end. Um, wow, uh, Pillars of the Earth. I, I can't believe I just now made it to Pillars of the Earth in 2021, you guys, because I think it originally came out way back in, what, 2010 or something like that? Good God. Um, Pillars of the Earth is very much like world without end, a very large cast. A lot of it has to do with greed and corruption within the church, once again, everyday people wanting to do the right thing. There's there's scandal. There's things being hidden and covered up by those in power uh, who have wealth and privilege and whatnot. Um, yeah, this story was just so, so good from start to finish. Um, once again, the same thing with World Without End. There is just so many miscellaneous things going on. So many random characters. So many random plots. And that's kind of the part of the fun of getting all of this intricate detail to weave together and it is it is truly very intricate detail that comes together because some things are kind of revealed throughout uh, pillars of the earth and it's like oh my god wow i can't i did not see that coming i did not see this twist or turn um so yeah pillars of the earth was definitely a fun time i freaking loved it and yeah the cast oh my god do not get me started on this cast you definitely got to watch pillars of the earth for this cast alone at number four, season six of Vikings. In the final ten episodes of Vikings' sixth season, Bjorn struggles to save Kattegat, Ivar travels to Rus to make new alliances, and Uba's travels find him discovering new lands, building to a climax that will change the future of Norway. Starring Alexander Ludwig, Alex Ho Anderson, Marco Ilso, and Jordan Patrick Smith. I am kind of devastated that Vikings is over. 
you guys. I'm a wee bit devastated. But hey, Netflix does have a spinoff show coming, Vikings Valhalla, which I'm excited about. I'm, I'm excited just to re return to the world of Vikings. Let me put it that way. But yeah, Vikings itself ended. Uh, it was very sad, but very satisfying. Uh, there, there's something about this final season that I think was very bittersweet. I think is, is a good word. The big thing about this final season is the fact that this world is changing during this time period. Uh, the Viking way of life is kind of almost dying out in some ways. Some of the biggest legends and people of their time period uh, have died and they've become part of legend. Um, and, and another big part of this show, it, it really has a lot to do with legacy, I think. What is the legacy you want to leave behind at the end of the day? Will you be good? Will your legacy be good? Will it be bad? Will you be the hero? Will you be the villain? Um, uh, uh, many of these characters, they want to leave behind a, a legacy. In some ways, death kind of terrifies them to some extent. Uh, they, they say they're not afraid of death because when they do die, they get to go to Valhalla, where they get just such a, a great life, apparently, in the afterlife. But at the same time, they're kind of scared of, of, of death, because what if they did not leave behind the legacy they want to leave behind, you know? So, uh, I really liked this season in, in general. It, it's a very reflective season, let me put it that way. I think the, the nature of this final season is very reflective, more so than being a wild and crazy action-packed season, because there's many scenes where characters are primarily just sitting and talking. They're reflecting about the past. They're, they're thinking about the future. They're thinking about the future beyond themselves after their death and whatnot. Um, and it does, it really does lend a, a bittersweetness to the season as it's winding down and whatnot. Um, so I did. I really appreciated this final season and what it was doing and what it was saying and ultimately where the characters went. Um, yeah, you may not be satisfied. There, there's many people who were not satisfied with this final season. Things did not kind of go in the direction some people were expecting. And yes, yeah, some people wanted, wanted it to be more action-packed. But for me, the season was all about reflection. Uh, and that's what I got out of it. And that's what I appreciated. And at the end of the day, I felt satisfied with the final season. At number three, The North Water. This five-part series follows a disgraced ex-army surgeon who signs up as a ship's doctor on a welling expedition to the Arctic, where his search for redemption is met with the harsh environment and his encounter with a psychopath aboard the ship, starring Jack O'Connell and Colin Farrell. Ooh, this was so good, you guys. Um, I was a little worried initially because episode one, I found a little bit boring. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I was a tad bit bored with episode one. Um, because episode one did have a lot to introduce. There's a lot that has to be introduced. And at, at the end of the day, in hindsight, it's like I kind of appreciate episode one a lot more because it did have to set up a lot. It had to set up the characters and kind of where everything's kind of ultimately going in some ways. Um, but oh boy, North Water was so good. And I feel like not many people have watched this. I've just not heard very many people talk about it or discuss it. And I think there's just so much to break down about this show and what it was trying to say and do and whatnot. And um, um, the performances by, by Jack O'Connell and Colin Farrell, oh boy, they play two completely different characters in some ways. Uh, Jack O'Connell's character is supposed to be the good guy. He's the hero. He's the guy you're rooting for. He's the guy you're sympathetic towards. And then Colin Farrell is, he, he's the bad guy. He's, he's ruthless. Um, he's, he's a murderer. Um, he's very aggressive. Um, he's just not willing to listen to anything. So I love the opposing points of view, the opposing powers we have between Jack O'Connell's character and uh, Colin Farrell's character. Just so interesting to watch whenever they're in any given scene together. And even though they are like on opposing sides and opposing forces in some ways, you know, good versus evil, it's like there's things that are almost kind of similar about them too, once you kind of dig in there. Because Jack O'Connell's character, 
it kind of does reach a point that in order for him to survive, he has to make some tough decisions and whatnot. Uh, and ultimately, what I found the show to be about at the end of the day, um, uh, it never really kind of goes into these themes. A lot of it you have to really read into and dig into, um, which is what I loved about the show. It, it never candy-coated anything, and it never just outright told you things. You know, it treated you, the viewer, like you were very intelligent. And yet the show has a lot to do with masculinity during this time period, because the whole cast is men. There's no women in the show, you guys. There is, like, I think one woman that pops up near the end of the show, but for the most part, the entire show is all men. It, it's about masculinity during this time period. Um, how men view themselves, how men view other men. Um, uh, the roles placed on men during this time period. Uh, just the good and the bad of masculinity during this time period. And um, the show, since it, it does take place kind of near the tail end of like the 1800s and whatnot, um, it also has a lot to do with imperialism during the time period and colonialism, kind of the decay and fall of imperialism. Uh, and once again, all of these themes are done in just such remarkable ways that treat you as an intelligent viewer. They, they're they never just out there spoken to you. You really got to dig into certain images. I loved how metaphorical the show was. And there's the use of a polar bear, you guys. The use of a polar bear in this show is absolutely fascinating and remarkable because that is where you get the themes of imperialism and masculinity being presented. What this polar bear kind of means. Um, because you have like a live polar bear and then you have like a, in one of the final episodes there's like a, a stuffed dead polar bear and whatnot. So uh, you really got to dig into some of the symbolism and metaphors going on and I just really appreciated that um, and it really made this show just so fascinating and I would just absolutely freaking love to watch it again to kind of maybe pick up on things in earlier episodes that I might not have picked up on later you know. Um, so yeah, nor The North Water, an amazing good time, so well written and directed and, and, ama and amazing performances. Um, yes, it is a pretty gruesome, brutal show. Uh, I'll give you a warning, because uh, it does, it's about, it's about people on a, on a welling boat. They're going out killing wells, they're going out killing seals because they need the, the fat and the oils, the skins uh, during this time period. That was hot, valuable commodities. Um, so there's, there is a pretty gruesome scene involving the murder of hundreds of poor Arctic seals. You guys, it was pretty hard to watch. Uh, but it, it's there for a reason and what it's trying to say in, in regards to some of the themes I brought up. So yeah, I love this show and I hope you guys check it out if you haven't already. At number two, season two of The Great. Set four months after launching the coup against her husband Peter, Catherine has to gain the upper hand to take the throne and turn Russia into a place of enlightenment. Starring Elle Fanning and Nicholas Holt. Oh my god, you guys, season two of this show. I was a little worried going into season two because I, I, I loved season one so much. There's always that concern that when a first season is so good that a, se a second season might kind of go downhill a little bit. It might not be as good. But I think season two was just as amazing as season one. It still had all that great humor and satire and wit. Um, and yeah, you, you watch this show for the chemistry between Elle Fanning and Nicholas Holt as Catherine the Great and uh, Peter. You watch the show for their chemistry and this love-hate dynamic that they have with them, with each other, and then you, the viewer, that you have with them. Um, uh, season two is all about Catherine uh, trying to get the throne of Russia because she has plans and ideas for Russia that, that Peter does not have. Peter has become a tyrant. He's kind of had Russia fall down and whatnot. And Catherine wants to bring enlightenment to Russia. She wants to bring new ideas. She wants to bring art and literature and women's rights. And she wants to protect um, like the serfs and give the serfs their freedom and whatnot. And of course the nobility in Russia during this time period, they're like, uh, no, we don't want any of that. Are you crazy woman? <laughs> 
So I, I love the nature of the show, and it is. It's a very satirical show. It's it, it's 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 poking fun at Russia. It's poking fun at governments and politics and leadership because all of those things they're they're a flawed system at the end of the day. There's 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 nothing that is perfect and ideal. And yeah, Catherine wants to make like a utopia, and it's never going to happen, you know. So I did. I love season two and where it went. Uh, and season three, I, I tell you what, season three, it, it needs to be in my life, like, right now, this instant. <laughs> and at number one, Atlantic Crossing. An eight-part series that follows the Crown Prince and Princess of Norway during the Nazi invasion of Norway during World War II and their relationship with U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt. Starring Sophia Helen, Tobias Santelman, and Kyle MacLachlan. Atlantic Crossing has stuck with me throughout the entirety of 2021. I think I watched it like early summer of 2021 and it quickly just became something that I instantly loved and appreciated and like I said it stuck with me throughout the remainder of the year and as you can see it made my number one out of everything that was on this list. Um, I just don't know what it was about the show that that held me. Um, I, I, I loved just everything about this show. For starters, it was a Nor Norwegian production. Uh, it is largely in Norwegian, but uh, once the Crown Princess Martha of Norway does head off to the United States, and she's with the, the President, President Roosevelt, uh, it, does, it is primarily in English then. So it is kind of a split thing of Norwegian and English. Um, so it's very easy to get into, I think. Uh, I love that. And I love just learning the history of Norway during this time because as much historical fiction World War II stuff that I have consumed, I've I've never really learned like a lot about what was going on with Norway during this time period. And yeah, I've never really heard about Princess Martha of Norway. I didn't know there was this relationship between Norway and uh, the U.S. during this time period and that Princess Martha formed a very close bond with President Roosevelt. I mean, this was all brand new stuff to me that I was learning that I found absolutely interesting. And um, I did watch this on PBS. And uh, PBS, what I loved that PBS did after each episode every week, they had a fact or fiction sheet that went with the episode. And I really greatly appreciated that because um, it gave the writers of the show a chance to be like, okay, this is all fact. This is what's fiction, what we took liberties with, and why we took those liberties. Um, so this show is actually incredibly accurate for the most part, which I, which I loved. And I loved having that little cheat sheet at the end of every episode, like, okay, here's fact and fiction. And, um, yeah, ultimately what this show is about, it has a lot to do with family and duty and patriotism during such a horrible time period here with World War II. And Princess Martha... She struggles with that. She's struggling with her duty to her country, her duty to her family, because she's also a woman at the end of the day. She's a woman who wants her own independence. She wants to prove her worth. Uh, she has to gain self-confidence over the course of the show. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's jealousy that arises between her husband and, and, and Roosevelt because her husband obviously thinks that she's having some sort of affair with the U.S. president, Roosevelt, you know. Um, so there's a lot of just interesting things going on in this show that really create Princess Martha as a an interesting historical woman of this time period and a woman that has kind of gone unheard of and has almost been forgotten to some extent. And she was such an incredible, remarkable woman during this time period, and I'm glad this show exposed the things that she was trying to do for Norway during this time, you know, the duty and patriotism that she had for her country, and what she was willing to do to, to get the U.S. involved to help out Norway and whatnot, because Norway was struggling during this time period. Um, so yeah, Atlantic Crossing, as you can see, ended up here at number one on my list. Uh, it's going to be a show that sticks with me for forever, I think. I, I, I loved it. it. It was an incredibly emotional show. I think I cried at least once in every single episode, you guys. And yeah, I felt like I was learning a lot of new things. So yeah, if you haven't seen this show, I highly recommend it and checking it out if it sounds like your sort of thing. So you guys, that is it for all three videos ranking my uh, all of the historical fiction and fantasy TV series that I watched in 2021. Uh, in the comments below, um, 
uh, did, what shows did you guys watch in 2021 that you liked? What would be your own personal rankings? Uh, did I have any shows on here that surprised you? Anything new that maybe you're like, oh, I'm interested in that? Or, yeah, do you disagree with a lot of my rankings? Uh, if you do, that's perfectly fine, because I would definitely love to know your opinions and why maybe you would place something up either higher or lower than how I had it on my list and whatnot. And, yeah, you guys, uh, this was a very lengthy video series, and uh, if you would love to see me do this again next year, let me know, because it, it was a very time-consuming project for me, and I'm just not sure if I want to do it again, if there's no interest in it. So let me know if you do have an interest, and if you would love to see me do it again next year. So that's it for this video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and if you like this video, you may like these other videos. Bye, guys.